Welcome to this online worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. I'm the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore, and I minister to this congregation along with the Reverend Jennifer Brower and the Reverend Jay Brooks. Although we continue to be physically distant to protect public health, we also continue to create a loving religious community, encourage spiritual growth, and build a more just and joyful world. At noon each Sunday, you're welcome to our interactive coffee hour to meet new friends and to see the faces of friends you already know and miss. This worship service originally had another title and theme, but it would be false to stick with subjects which can apply at other times when there is a need for particular reflections at this particular moment. A virus is still circling the globe, bringing anxiety and fear, illness and isolation and death. People, especially our young people, are out in the street protesting in grief and anger the killing of George Floyd. So today, our service is about engaging our moral imagination. We are not only called to be involved in this particular moment in the changes in our world, or to listen and learn only now, but to engage in a deep reimagining of what our transformed world might become. In this community that values the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, we gather to affirm, to practice, and to become the change we wish to see, to answer the call of love. The words of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This is where we are. Where do we go from here? First, we must massively assert our dignity and worth. We must stand up amidst a system that still oppresses and develop an unassailable and majestic sense of values. What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and love without power is sentimental and anemic. 
Power at its best is love implementing the demands of justice. And justice at its best is power correcting everything that stands against love. And this is what we must see as we move on. One of our Shelter Rock commitments is to help create a more just and joyful world. As our nation has faced the challenges of COVID-19, we've all seen the inequality in resources, with the pandemic disproportionately devastating marginalized communities. During June and July, our special collection goes to the Solidarity Fund of Long Island Jobs with Justice. Since the pandemic began, the Solidarity Fund has served as an emergency resource for all immigrants and especially for those who are undocumented and thus not eligible for government assistance. The need is great and still growing. If you are able, please donate to help our community's most vulnerable families. Because we practice physical distancing to protect each other's health, we ask that you contribute online. For many of us, online giving started out as a technological challenge, but people are getting good at it, perhaps because the world's deep need has called all of us to new learning. To give through our website, on the home page, choose Donate in the menu bar, then click Donate Now and scroll down to Special Collection. Remember, our vision is, in part, to create a more just and joyful world. Let's share our resources and bring a little joy. As curfews in many cities are about to begin again tonight, we're at a place where we don't need to go searching past events and expert opinions in order to understand the protests around the killing of George Floyd. We can analyze it first person. Tonight, journalist and author Dawn Turner shares her humble opinion on why we all need to make a connection between the pandemic and the protests. When I was a columnist for the Chicago Tribune, I often wrote about race in poor African-American communities. Many times, well-meaning white readers would ask me, what can I do? 
I want you to know that this pandemic has afforded you a vantage point like none other. This is your opportunity to know what people who live in poor communities face and feel every day, long before COVID. I want you to remember what it feels like to stand in long lines to enter stores. Because in poor black communities, some merchants, fearing theft from a few bad apples, have long restricted the number of people they allow in at one time. And those plexiglass dividers that protect store workers now, well, their bulletproof cousins have been mounted in stores in black communities for ages. I want you to remember the knot of anxiety you feel wondering whether there will be enough eggs or meat or even toilet paper on store shelves. Poor people living in food deserts face scarcity all the time. I want you to remember the unease of walking past boarded up businesses and jogging down barren streets because that's what poor black people who live in blighted communities experience every day. I want you to remember what it feels like to have to hole up in your house because the world beyond your door is dangerous and filled with people who could cost you your life. I want you to remember what it feels like to lose your job and not only to be stripped of vital income and all that entails, but of purpose and those connections that motivate and inspire us. I want you to remember how it feels to have to stand in line to ask for a handout and how you worry that people will ask you, how did you get yourself in this situation? If you take away nothing else from this pandemic, I want you to remember how powerless and hopeless and disaffected this moment has rendered you. I want you to realize that for poor black people, this is not a moment. If this pandemic offers even a smidgen of empathy, then maybe you understand why people might rise up and rage. What you've got to do is finish what you have begun. I don't know just how, but it's not over till you've won. When you see the storm is coming, see the lightning part the skies. It's too late to run. There's terror in your eyes. What you do then is remember this old thing you heard me say. It's the storm, not you, that's bound to blow. Say, 
The 19th century Unitarian minister and abolitionist, the Reverend Theodore Parker, said something in an 1853 sermon that has resonated deeply in the last century and a half. His words resonated with Abraham Lincoln, who subscribed to Parker's sermons and read them as they were published. His words resonated with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. They resonate with me today. Here's what Theodore Parker said so many years ago. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from what I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. I am marching every day I'm meeting trials on my way Short on blessings But I'm going on just the same have heard the shorthand version of Theodore Parker's words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King or from President Barack Obama. 
The arc of the universe is long, but it bends toward justice. These words were even woven into the rug laid down in the White House Oval Office during Barack Obama's presidency. The arc of the universe bends towards justice. These words speak of a certainty, an inevitability of justice, of its ultimate victory. I understand the power of these words as rhetoric. I understand the power of these words as shelter in moments of weariness or doubt or fear. But I like the complexity of Parker's full quote better. He said, I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience, and from where I see, I am sure it bends toward justice. Parker did not pretend to understand why there is no justice in the world now. And he sees no guarantee that the universe will do as he wishes, but his conscience moves him to actions through which justice may be achieved. He had never experienced a truly just world, nor have we. But his conscience led him to move in ways that he felt might get him to this promised land. The arc of the universe is long, and his conscience demands that he do his part to bend it toward justice. The Unitarian Parker was brave enough, faithful enough to engage his moral imagination in working for the abolition of American slavery. Martin Luther King echoed Parker's words during his march for civil rights. After being elected the first black United States president, Barack Obama laid Parker's words down on a rug in the Oval Office, perhaps to remind himself to continue to bend the universe towards justice, to remember to use power in the service of love. And what now? Where are we now? We are grieving, we are angry, we are anxious and afraid. Pandemic, lockdown, isolation, death, racism and inequality laid bare, police murder and protests coming to lay itself on top of the open wound of today's society. In the words of the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Susan Frederick Gray, it is devastating to see the impacts of COVID-19 in black communities in cities like Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, and New Orleans. These impacts are the direct result of generations of racism, divestment, redlining, and discrimination. They show up as disparities in environmental pollutants in neighborhoods, who is able to telework and who isn't, who has never had consistent access to healthy food or adequate health care, who must still be out working in low paid essential services. These disparities in impact and their causes are also happening to Latino communities in Boston and New York. And we know this racial disparity will be repeated across the country. In light of this reality, Reverend Frederick Gray has come to believe that we cannot separate the theological, pastoral, and prophetic mission of our ministries. Not in our faith, and I would say, not in our moral imagination. We should not offer words of reconciliation without truth-telling or hope without first acknowledging suffering. There can be no easy grace each person must decide not whether to participate in justice making, only how to participate in the ways that suit them. Not everyone can or should be in the streets at this moment, 
but we must know that this is and must be a movement and not merely a march. We must grieve the pain of these times and feel the long arc of this pain. Can we be clear in our hearts that the cry, Black Lives Matter, arises from an American history and culture that has devalued the lives of black and brown people and declared some people marginal, expendable. George Floyd has come to symbolize all this and more. His death represents all the murders and lynching of black people over centuries. He represents all the lives cut short the worth and dignity denied. So we are often asked to sit together and count the minutes it took George Floyd to die. The eight minutes and 46 seconds that a Minneapolis police officer pushed his knee into George Floyd's neck. This murder in the daylight on a public street while surrounded by other police officers with witnesses and a camera phone rolling. We are asked to hold our breath or count down the moments on a clock or recite the names to mark the death of a human being. I'm afraid that this is actually not too hard to do. Not hard enough. After living in this nation, knowing our history of racism, is it really so hard to imagine the violent death of a black man? How often have we already seen it? Sudden, violent, and shocking death taking moments, or the systemic, generational, slow death of black, indigenous, and people of color. I believe our history, our experience, makes this all too possible to envision. Our moral imagination calls us to transform this picture. Imagine instead the full, vital, creative, joyful, fulfilled life, the long life George Floyd might have lived. Imagine a world where black lives matter and help to make that a reality for his children, for mine, and for yours. So may it be.
Won't you celebrate with me what I have shaped into a kind of life? I had no model born in Babylon, both non-white and woman. What did I see to be except myself? I made it up here on this bridge between starshine and clay, my one hand holding tight my other. Come, celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again.